So, we've got about 20 minutes, <laughs> slightly less than I thought. I'll, I'll, I'll rush through this fairly quickly, or I, I, I won't hang around. There's quite a lot of content here. Um, when we were putting this, this idea together, I said, oh, 10 top tips are great. You know, there's, all, you know, there's always useful value in um, an exercise where you sort of share um, you know, ideas on how to, how to improve projects in this, in this case. Um, and then, of course, actually, I started producing, you know, writing the presentation, putting everything together, and realised, shit, there's actually quite a lot of content here. Um, so, I will endeavour to move through fairly quickly. Um, but, just to sort of set the scene, um, obviously, we're all familiar with the dreaded IT project being quite challenging at some point. And I think what we need to do, actually, is try and rethink how we consider projects. Um, I'm preaching, I guess, to some of the converters here, but actually I think some of the messages here, um, you know, we do need to think of things differently. And quite often, when people learn things, I don't know if anybody came to the Agile on the Beach um, event, uh, the pre-conference, called uh, the, one of the keynote speakers at Agile on the Beach this year, was, <coughs> excuse me, Jesse from who introduced the concept of unlearning. And we kind of need to unlearn the way that we sort of used to do IT projects. When I say we, and I'm not referring to lots of people in this room, but we as a sort of wider business population need to think of projects changing. Um, one, of the, one of the issues um, we have really is that um, we get kind of fixed on ideas um, and so we need to change that. So here's the top 10 tips. Um, right, that's it. Right, so, uh, yeah, so th those are things we're going to talk about. Before I talk about them, um, so here, here's a very famous painting um, screen. Uh, there are actually four of these produced, actually. Um, and uh, the, uh, the artist, um, the second one, I think, or the second pastel version was sold for about $120 million. Um, it was nicked uh, about 15 years ago, so 14 years ago. It was found again. Um, a few years later. Um, anyway, so <laughs> this is a very famous picture. Um, actually, what the artist actually said was, um, um, oh shit, that's a very crap looking um, dog, isn't it? So, can you see the dog? I hope that's all I can see is the dog. <laughs> with, with, with floppy ears? Yeah. Uh, Can you see? Can anyone see the dog? Yeah. yeah. So it's like a, um, it's a sort of dog with floppy ears and stuff. And as soon as you see that, all of a sudden, and like you know, the next time you see the picture, you just think, oh, that's a dog. It's a picture of a dog. So all of a sudden, just imagine if you spent 120 million dollars on this painting, and all of a sudden, all you see is a dog. It's like it's only worth 100 million now. Um, what, what the point here is that actually, what we need to do is we need to. We need to rethink how we look at IT projects and we need to look at doing them differently. I'd say we, I know half of this room at least, are probably looking at IT projects differently anyway. So I'm speaking for all the rest of the businesses out there. So let's move on with um, a few of these sort of top tips on how to improve projects. Um, so first of all, software needs to constantly evolve. Um, so one of the, the old way of building software was when you do some Design. So this this graph is a you know sort of cost and time. Um, so first of all, the, you, you know the, the typical waterfall approach where you go through a design phase, then you go through um, a, a build phase, and then you uh, test and fix, um, and then you uh, release. And one of the challenges here, of course, actually, is with with this is that this can take quite a long time. It takes a lot of money to actually get through that whole process. And when you eventually get to the end of it, you end up in a situation where that red line is value, and you've had all this cost. As soon as you sort of finish with the cost, it, the business value of that software increases sharply just before release. And from that point on, it basically depreciates. So you, you, you invest huge amounts of money, or businesses, organizations, Excuse me, invest in huge amounts of money in, in you know, amazing systems 
and then they, that's it. Those systems then just get less and less valuable until the end where they go, let's do it all over again. And this is the sort of old model of, um, of, of uh, systems and software development. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the next, what we have here is more of a system of continuous development. And this is where you release a lot earlier. So the actual release of the software occurs much, much earlier than it would have done with that sort of big waterfall approach. You may not have all of the features, but the first features that get released of the new system are the most valuable ones. So continuous development is really an important part of that. So the next tip um, is having really effective communication between um, your team and its stakeholders. Um, when I was putting this presentation together, I was looking, I was going to represent a diagram of lots of different people. And the, before I got to the before I could find the little people icon, I found pictures of animals. So, um, so essentially, here are some developers. These are unicorn developers, which is an in-house joke with uh, developers who think that they're somehow unicorns and that they can do anything. They can, they, they're brilliant at front end, back end, everything. They, they can test, they can um, pass in you know, QA effectively, they can do sys admin, DevOps. Um, so, but essentially, I'm a group of developers, and a lot of people just think, right, okay, let the developers get on with it. Well, of course, that's where things go wrong. The most, the next, one of the next most important parts of the whole process, uh, we believe, is actually you need to have a product owner. So you need to have. Um, I chose Lion simply because sometimes product owners can be fierce. Sometimes they need to be fierce. Not necessarily with developers, so, but later on we we'll see that they need to be fierce with lots of other. People. But, no, there's a king of the jungle or something like that. Um, so, it's really important that those, those two groups actually have that effect in communication, obviously. So, the product owner is the person who's defining what the product will be. The product could be the system, it could be, it could be a system that's going to be sold out to other people, it could be a system that's been used within. Um, but the term that's sort of generally used is the idea of product, and the product owner is the person that. Um, looks after that product and it identifies what its features are. Um, in, a, in old terminology, it might have been called business analysts. Um, the problem with business analysts is that they would just produce huge, huge documents um, full of analysis of business requirements um, and not necessarily uh, be so focused around what the what a product would actually deliver. Uh, the next the next part, um, it also aids communication because when you have a product owner that's just thinking about product and then you have a load of de developers or worse still, unicorn developers who think that they know everything, is that these people are just like, they've both got their focus but they're not focusing on effective communication between one another. They're not focusing on how to be an effective team, how to work collaboratively, they're just the developers think about development, the product owner is thinking about features and what features he wants to prioritise next. And so you need to bring in um, a wise, agile coach or agile facilitator, sometimes called a scrum master if you're using agile scrum. Um, and this person basically interacts with the, with the other two groups to actually help facilitate more effective communication between those two. Um, so that's great, that's the sort of magic triangle of development. Um, but the most important thing next, of course, is that the product owner is actually um, get, gleaning the right type of information from the business. And that's where you add in the organizational business and you know, there's lots of different people there. Some of them, are, um, some of them think that they're um, cockerels, some of them think they're peacocks, some of them are um, a little bit slow, don't really like change, and some of them are little monkeys. Um, <laughs> there, were, there, were other, there were other animals to choose from, but I thought those were the four. I, I can imagine, I've, I've worked with organisations where all four things of those animals are represented by real people, actually. Um, so, and this is where actually the agile facilitator really is over. The wise owl is actually overseeing that, that communication between product owners. So what we have here is from left to right, an organisation of stakeholders right the way through to developers and you know, the most important thing there is effective communication. 
So, next, um, high level requirements, roadmaps versus large scale documentation. So, in simple terms, <clears throat> it is important to have you know, a long term, a high level vision of what a system is going to do. But to go into huge amounts of detail will mean that you end up producing huge amounts of documentation. And, you know, um, and that sometimes there is a balance between the, the old way of traditional way of doing things was produce huge great documents, um, massive great designs, which could take three months, six months, a year, 18 months. I, you know, I first spoke to somebody who works on a project where they spent 18 months designing the whole thing. And then they spent another two years building it. And then another year sort of um, trying to fix all the bugs. And then another year trying to repurpose it to do what they then needed it to do five years after they started the project. Um, so avoid that sort of large scale um, project documentation and huge levels of design, but still have high level requirements um, and, and roadmaps. So next one, I introduced, um, I was said I'd be talking about beer, um, holiday, car and house. Um, and this is a great little, um, great little system that I picked up from um, Dave Farley. Um, so Dave Farley um, was one of the co um, authors of the first book on continuous delivery, from the keynote speaker at Agile on the Beach about four years ago. Came in last year, actually did some training with us, and earlier on this year, I think he did some training for UP. So this is for, um, to allow stakeholders, first of all, to get involved in identifying um, against business value, but identifying requirements and essentially trying to ascertain the value, the business value of different requirements against the scale of um, cost of a beer, cost of a holiday, cost of a car, cost of a house. So what's the equivalent value of, of, a, of a requirement? So they can add in you know, a need, so I, I've called it need, you can say, you probably say requirements, but requirements didn't fit into the box, so I've called them needs instead. Um, so need one, um, you know, might have the business value and impact of a house, or the value of a house. Uh, need two is, you know, the value of a holiday. Uh, need three is sort of roughly the value of a car. Need four, you know, so you basically put your requirements and uh, the needs of your software um, on, on this type of scale. And uh, that sort of allows everyone to sort of see you know, roughly what the sort of uh, approximate value of different aspects of the different requirements of your software uh, future systems are. You then bring in your developers, and they, they help you identify the development cost, and again, against the same scale. So, what you find is then, is that you can then, you can move across these requirements against that scale. So, you can see there that need one at the value of um, a holiday, and need two is the sort of value, you know, nearly as valuable as a car. Um, this one. So in terms of sorry, in terms of cost, it's it's you know, only it's going to cost less than a holiday to build that the second need. And this one, um, oh shit, it's going to cost like it's going to cost a house to build. So as you can as you do this exercise, what's great about it is that. You've got business organisation stakeholders who can actually understand what the business value and impact is. And they can see that even though their first, their first priority was to, their first need, um, they think it's got the value of a house, but it's going to be quite expensive. And so, and then the, well, actually need four, well let's face it, who's going to spend you know, the cost of a house on building something that's got the value of a few beers or some moments, you know, a few beers in a holiday. Uh, this allows everybody in the organisation to actually understand why some things that they might like, so, you know, this requirement number four there might have been a, a really, you know, really well-liked idea, but actually it's just not going to provide the return on investment. So, this therefore allows you to prioritise. So, moving on to the fifth, um, Tip here is about prioritisation. So I've taken those sort of four basic requirements. Um, normally in a, in a project you've got you know maybe a few dozen requirements, but simplifying it for the purposes of explanation. So we've taken our original um, list of ideas and we've now put them in um, the first batch of priority queue. And so here we have a 
series of needs for our piece of software, for our solution. So, first of all, and, the, and this is sort of based on return ordered in terms of return on investment, and we get on and build the first requirement there. That first need, number three, is delivered first. So we deliver that, and then we see, right, okay, then we move on to the, sort of the next iteration, next phase of the project. Um, and you know, this might be one week, two weeks, a month, three months after you start, depending on the size of the project and things. But essentially, we've ticked off, we've, we've um, achieved that, that top need, that top requirement. And now, but what's actually happened now is that we've, we've released it, we've um, allowed people to start using that first requirement, and now that we've found that there's actually, now there's a fifth requirement that's been added to the, the bottom of the backlog. Um, but it's important to make sure we don't just add things to the bottom, actually. We, we, should, um, we should be looking at reprioritizing at this point. And so now what happens is um, we prioritize. Actually, the, the, the latest requirement that's come in is now the sort of next highest priority for, for being delivered. So you can imagine, and, and as we go on through subsequent iterations, you, you then start ticking off those, and then we add in, and there's another couple of requirements there. And uh, after reprioritization, you see that um, those, those newer requirements actually may be considered to have a higher um, return on investment or higher business value, and they get prioritized and they get completed. So across the course of, the, of this project, you can see that some of the, you know, the, the lower priority initial requirements might never actually be delivered because it, with, a, uh, with a really effective um, continual, with continual release and uh, with an effective agile approach, you can, you know, you're continually allowing the business to input more new requirements as the project is progressing. And as a result, some of your original requirements may never ever be delivered, which is quite scary when you say, say that to a board when they sign up, they provide sign off to, um, <coughs> We're just about to get signed off on a project from a company that turned over a quarter of a billion, quite a local company, well, relatively local. And uh, you know, the, the IT director is saying, right, so here's a list of requirements, but we're going to have to I'm going to have to explain to the board that this is what you're signing off on, but you may not get all of this stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's quite hard. You know, it's hard for people with a traditional mindset who think of you know, the screen as that famous picture that's worth 120 million. Not 20 or whatever, you know, to, to actually sort of understand this sort of new way of working. But nonetheless, this is, um, you know, to never achieve um, your lowest priorities means that those other priorities that sort of came in above that are delivering higher business value than your lowest priority initial requirements. Um, and therefore, your software, your end solution is going to deliver much better business value overall. Um, number six, halfway through, only 75% through on time. Um, so let's um, use a story mapping. Um, again, this is a, a, a type of prioritization exercise. Um, very quickly, you, know, you divide the area of the product. So those previous examples were sort of relatively simplistic because they just assumed there was a single priority queue. Actually, if you take a product, so this is a, a, a kind of basic e-commerce site, I suppose you might say. It's a product search, which is a, a, a feature area. Um, and you can, then there's a the product page, it's important to have that, you're going to have to have that. And you're also going to have to have a checkout. And there'll be some other, other areas, which for, for, a, for an e-commerce product or um, projects, you, you know, you're going to need some of these, these areas. And it's hard to have a single priority um, queue. So actually, you, you put your, your requirements or your needs, categorise the quantitative areas, and then you can see that you bring, release one, you can actually bring in line um, the, the requirements that you definitely need for release one. And this allows you to sort of still follow that lean, the MVP approach, but you can um, try and gauge equivalence between features across different product areas. Um, and it kind of just helps, particularly with larger projects where you've got, for example, different divisions 
So you might have the tortoise, the monkey, and the you know, chicken division. There's three different divisions. They've all got three different priorities. And you somehow need to actually get them to all understand that other people's priorities are just as important as them. And, and this is a one, one method of helping them, um, to help them to understand that they can't just have everything that they want by shouting as loud with me as they can. Um, sometimes happens, of course. Right, so, use the story mapping. I mean, there's book to it, not that. I mean, it's a huge, huge exercise, but it's worth looking into and considering. Um, so, next one. And this, this I discovered, um, was a, this is a brilliant one, actually, but um, I know, I think Sam talked about um, a, uh, where you, in discovery, actually, you can basically fail projects. And if you identify um, high-risk areas, then quite often you will find that you know sometimes that can destroy projects at the beginning. The other thing it can do sometimes you find the high risk areas of, of a potential project and then you identify if you can solve those, if you are actually reduce the risk of them, there may be a technical risk. So a, a simple example, a very simple example is um, you, you're going to do some sort of integration with an API. So we're doing, we're doing a product, and, um, an internal product at the moment actually where we've got it. And, and the team said, yeah, yeah, well, it, it just integrates with the API for that other system. I said, right, really, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, we've done, I, I, you know, I saw a project where we integrated the first integration with eBay My Garage, which is the biggest eBay shop in the world, and, you know, massive, 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 massive project. Um, huge, huge amounts of data, um, half the API didn't work properly, um, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things you find with any kind of integration, in, from experience, is that, you know, it's fine providing the API you're integrated with has, um, is designed to do everything that you need it to do, which isn't always the case. So, you know, that's an example of a high risk area that you might just want to go through the specification of exactly what you want to get um, from this API and is it actually designed, is it going to provide you with the data that you need so you can actually have an effective integration? Because if it's not, then you may, you may only get part of the functionality you're looking for. And if, if, if that means you can't get some of the functionality which is critical to you, for your stakeholders, then you know, as a high risk area, it's useful to be able to um, identify that early so that the, your stakeholder can go, right, okay, yeah, we still want to carry on despite the fact we're not going to have some of the functionality we thought we were going to have, or they can choose to stop that part of the project or stop the whole project if it's that critical. So identifying high risk areas from a project delivery perspective is it can help help things succeed long term. It's far better to stop a project when you've stuck done five percent or even ten percent of it than when you know than the business discovers when they've spent ninety-five percent of the budget that actually won't do what they actually wanted to do. And that really does get people far more disappointed than if they've only spent five or ten percent of the budget. Um, teams, get real teams, not groups of individuals. So people that can work really effectively as teams is really, really important. That's one of our, one of our teams. Um, and yeah, they've worked together for a few years now. And yeah, they're just, I mean, a, a team that can work really effectively together is always going to be far more effective than a group of individuals. Um, we've got some horror stories of groups of individuals that um, effectively, um, yeah, some of them thought they were unicorns and they were just, you know, they were not team players, they were just not able to work together. A really effective team would always be far more effective um, for your, and deliver a far better result for your project. Um, consider long term support. So, in, in, I can remember there's somebody that used to be, sell one off um, off the shelf systems, and he said, Well, we always work on 20%, that's the industry standard. Occasionally, it might be down to 15% if somebody negotiates hard and you know it's a solid product, but most, you know, this was the rule of thumb used when people would sell, you know, 50 grand worth of software and then they'd sort of support it for 10 grand. You know, that was the sort of 20% rule of thumb. Um, that was in the old days of just one-off projects and then ongoing support. Um, I think what's happening now is that we're seeing, with continuous, you know, you might have a sort of long-term support of software. Um, you don't know if it's actually going to take 20% of the actual cost of the initial cost of delivering um, a piece of software. 
Um, so a far better approach is, and this is more of a sort of DevOps development operational program. So you've got a fixed budget there, um, and that budget's either used for operational support um, or it's used for development support. Same team supporting and developing new features. So that allows you to have a fixed budget um, and then either you know, a certain amount of that time is prioritised towards operations and making sure that your system is supported and it's running mm. and then the rest of the time, instead of being you know, in effect wasted, it's used for development work. And this is one of, one of the advantages of the DevOps approach where you can, um, it's, it's a far more efficient way of doing things. Also what happens of course is that the developers, because they have to fix all the problems that they created, or maybe not intentionally, but um, they, they, they will always be thinking, well instead of just like putting the cork in the hole to sort of stop the water coming out, let's actually try and understand and fix the problem. Uh, and they're far more likely to think long term, because they just want to be in development, they don't want to be having to sort out, you know, fix operational issues. And in the long run, you'll actually see um, yeah, potentially better development approaches because <coughs> operational, um, you know, develop, the developers are thinking about reducing the operational support costs because it's basically taking up and wasting their time when they prefer to be doing development. Um, and finally, uh, five experienced people. Um, having an effective team means having lots of wide range of people, but people that have got experience of some of the problems that you're going to face are always going to be more useful than people that don't have experience with those problems. Not, not to say those people won't be able to eventually overcome those problems, and this doesn't mean that you can only have experienced people working on a project, because you know, that, that would be crazy too, because that would just be very expensive. So having a, a wide range of people, but if you can find somebody that's got some, some experiences of um, overcoming some of the challenges that you've got, in that project area, that will always be um, that will always pay back over time. Thank you. Any questions?